Well, here's what I think of as the crown jewel of evolution and uh, creation. Um, it's certainly our greatest unexplored scientific frontier. It's a source of mystery and wonder, the side of most frequent side of crippling incurable disease. Uh, some people say it's the seat of the soul. Uh, I don't know that it's the seat of the soul, but it's certainly through our brain and mind that we become aware of our own essence, our own soul. Now, we w everything that we do today, we want to try to develop see-through x-ray vision. And we want to look through the surface and see where various structures are located. So as you look from lateral, is the frontal horn going to be medial to the inferior frontal gyrus? Or is it going to be medial to the middle frontal gyrus? Does anyone want to take a shot at that? Well, the answer is medial to the inferior frontal gyrus, and we'll talk about that. Now, what do we call this upturn, the gyrus around the upturned posterior end of the sylvian fissure in this area? What gyrus is that? Supramarginal, angular. Here's central sulcus. Now, where are you going to find the atrium? It's deep to supramarginal gyrus. Uh, here we're looking at the lateral surface of a hemisphere, central sulcus, inferior frontal gyrus. This is Broca's area on, on the right side, say. Here's the middle frontal gyrus. And we're going to remove the inferior frontal gyrus to expose the insula. And plotted on the insula now, we have the outer margin of the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum forms anterior wall and roof of frontal horn. So all of the roof is below the here genu and body of callosum in this area, medial to the inferior frontal gyrus. Here we've lifted out some of the supramarginal gyrus in this area, and atrium is going to be deep to supramarginal gyrus. Now, what is in the midline, absolute midline, deep to this middle, short, insular gyrus, foramen of Monroe, and medial to middle temporal gyrus is going to be where the pineal is located. Now, if you go and think all the way through to the medial falsing surface of the hemisphere, what sulcus on the medial surface ends up here? Anyone? Well, that's the marginal ramus of the cingulate sulcus. It comes up, what do we call that area on the medial surface where the motor and sensory cortex fold over to the medial surface against the fox? What is that area? Paracentral lobule. The marginal ramus turns up behind the paracentral lobule. And what sulcus on the medial surface ends up here? Parieto occipital, and here, calcarine sulcus. You see that it's at the lower part of the medial surface, but it's well above the lower part of the lateral surface. So that here we see cingulate sulcus plotted laterally and the marginal ramus turning up beside 
the paracentral lobule, here the parieto occipital and calcarine sulci. Here we've outlined the margin of the thalamus, which sets uh, deep to the lower margin of the uh, pre and post central gyri. So the area of the thalamus. So and foramen of Monroe, pineal. So you want to develop this see-through x-ray kind of visual anatomy. Here we see cingulate sulcus, marginal ramus, paracentral lobule. We plotted central sulcus on the lateral surface here on the medial surface. It passes at its lower margin uh, lateral to the body of the ventricle. The frontal horn is medial to the inferior frontal gyrus. The atrium is medial to the supramarginal gyrus. And here we've outlined the insula on the medial surface and the back margin of the insula where the last branch of the middle cerebral turns away from the insula is located at the anterior margin of the atrium that's formed by pulvinar of thalamus in this area. So we want to have that see-through x-ray vision, another hemisphere inferior frontal gyrus, pre and post central gyri, supramarginal gyrus, and here we're looking at frontal horn that is medial to inferior frontal gyrus, atrium deep to supramarginal gyrus, temporal horn medial to middle temporal gyrus, and here you see pre and post central gyri are located lateral to the body of the ventricle. And we're going to talk about choroidal fissure that runs from foramen of Monroe through the body, atrium, and temporal horn, and it ends at the inferior choroidal point located behind the head of the hippocampus. So it doesn't run to the tip of the temporal horn. The choroid plexus is attached in body, atrium, temporal horn. Uh, now, when you're looking into ventricle from above, how close does the internal capsule come to the foramen of Monroe? Uh, are you going to find internal capsule at A? Anyone for A? B? How many for B? Genu of capsule. At C, anyone? How far over is it? Here we're looking now at the central core of the hemisphere. Uh, help me with this. This structure is, anyone? Putamen. And here is anterior limb, posterior limb, genu of capsule, just lateral to the foramen of Monroe, the internal capsule comes up to the wall of the ventricle, so you want to be very careful. Face and fibers and arm fibers are very close to this area, so that if you look at genu of capsule, it's here directly lateral to foramen of Monroe. You want to be very careful if you're uh, retracting this part of the ventricle. Uh, now, here we've removed um, here the pallidum, globus pallidus. We're looking at internal capsule. And fiber dissections have become much more important today. And here today and, and in the future, you're going to see many more images like this that look at anterior limb, genu, posterior limb of internal capsule. And 
uh, this type of imaging is becoming a much more important step in planning surgical procedures. Here's a glioma in cerebrum. Uh, and the question was, was the internal capsule posterior or anterior? And some of the functional studies suggested that it was posterior to the tumor here. But on imaging, it turned out that the internal capsule was anterior and medial to this glioma. So this kind of imaging is becoming much more important. Now, as you look through the surface of the hemisphere, where are you going to find the M1 segment of middle cerebral artery? Anyone, anyone for A? C, B, uh, D. Well, and where are the major trunks? The superior and inferior, or superior, middle, and inferior, if there's a trifurcation. Where are you going to find those major trunks of the middle cerebral? Well, if you, here's a hemisphere now, and this is the superior temporal gyrus. Here's M1 coming out. You find it medial to superior temporal gyrus. And the major trunks are going to be running backwards then, uh, in large part, medial to the superior temporal gyrus. Here we're looking from anterior, M1 here, medial to superior temporal gyrus, and then the main trunks run back medial also to the uh, superior temporal gyrus. Here's where that last branch of the middle cerebral turns away from the insula. Here's atrium, but that sylvian point is located at the anterior margin of the atrium. So you want to fit the arteries into this image. The stem arteries turn upward from the major trunks along the insula to exit the sylvian fissure. And now where is the anterior cerebral going to be located as you look through the lateral surface at A, B, or C, that pericolosal? Anyone want to help me? It'll be running at C, about the level of the inferior frontal sulcus, and it's running around the corpus callosum at, at the upper margin of the frontal horn. Now, where are you going to find the posterior cerebral artery as you look through from the lateral surface? Anyone for C? B, okay, A. Well, it's lower than this lateral surface. It will be at B. So, and the reason for that is if you look at the course here in the ambient cistern of posterior cerebral artery, the tent and cerebellum are all sloped upward so that as you get further medial, the area where you find posterior cerebral artery is significantly higher than that lower margin of the lateral surface. So, and often that posterior cerebral artery, if you look at the upper surface of the parahippocampal gyrus in the ambient cistern, it's going to run on not below the parahippocampal gyrus, but often on the upper surface of parahippocampal gyrus. So, uh, and so that parahippocampal gyrus here has a lower surface, a medial surface, and an upper surface, and posterior cerebral artery often runs on that upper surface of parahippocampal gyrus medial to the temporal horn. So looking through again from laterally, 
we fitted in the ventricles into this view. Uh, and here we plotted at the level of the superior temporal sulcus, the lower margin of the insula. So the inferior limiting sulcus of the insula is at this level. And here we see the choroidal fissure, uh, which has the fornix on the outer margin, body, crus, fimbria of fornix on the outer margin, and thalamus on the inner margin. It's the same in body, atrium, temporal horn. Fornix is on the outer margin, thalamus is on the inner margin, uh, and if you open the choroidal fissure in the body, you end up in third ventricle. If you open it in the atrium, you end up beside the pineal. You open in, in the temporal horn, you open up in ambient cistern. Now, what is this structure that hangs down into the roof of the ambient cistern? Anyone? This is, it's part of thalamus. It's the visual relay. So that's lateral geniculate body. And here the choroidal fissure ends behind the head of the hippocampus and behind this structure in the anterior wall of the temporal horn, which is the amygdala. Uh, we see the anterior choroidal artery come into this area, and here we've removed the thalamus, preserved the body, crus, fimbria of fornix. Always when we open the choroidal fissure, we want to open on the fornicial side, on the side of the body, crus, fimbria. Here, if we open in the temporal horn, we see the posterior cerebral artery in the ambient cistern. If we open in front of the cruce of the fornix, we end up in the quadrigeminal cistern beside the pineal. And if we open the fissure out of the body of the ventricle, we end up in third ventricle, but coming through from the body to the third, we open this space between the fornix and the stria medullaris thalami that we call the velum, what? Velum interpositum. Uh, so now, what are the arteries that supply and pass through the choroidal fissure to supply the plexus. Well, in the temporal horn, we have anterior choroidal artery that arises from carotid, passes around the uncus. The uncus uh, has an anterior segment, a posterior segment, and an apex. And it passes around the apex and enters the temporal horn at the inferior choroidal point. So we see anterior segment of uncus containing amygdala, posterior segment contains head of hippocampus, the apex of the uncus is lateral to the third nerve, and the anterior choroidal arises from carotid, passes around the anterior and posterior segment of the uncus enters the temporal horn at the inferior choroidal point. Now, here we're looking at the thalamic area, the ambient cistern from below. And here we see posterior cerebral artery and arising from the P2 segment 
are the lateral posterior carotid arteries that pass between the fimbria and the pulvinar to enter choroid plexus and posterior temporal horn and atrium. When we look below, we also here have taken off the lingual gyrus where the upper visual field is located. Here we see the calcarine sulcus, the deep end of it. It cuts into the medial margin of the atrium at the level of the calcar avus and is separated from the deep end of the calcarine sulcus by only a thin layer of cortex here at the level of the calcar avus, which the prominent chair in the medial wall of the atrium. And then arising from P1, passing through the crural and ambient cisterns, and then quadrigeminal cistern is the medial posterior choroidal artery that passes along this area. Here are the lateral posterior choroidal arteries, and then the medial posterior choroidal arteries turn forward beside the pineal, right in the velum interpositum, and pass through the fissure to supply the choroid plexus in the body of the ventricle. So here we're looking into frontal horn and body from above. And if you come through the corpus callosum in this area, Half the time, you'll open into the right lateral ventricle. Half the time, into the left lateral ventricle. And often you lose these uh, prominences and uh, sort of sulcal areas between the structures in the wall. If you're, the ventricle at the foramen of Monroe is occluded, and it becomes a round cavity so that when you look into the uh, ventricle coming through the corpus callosum with a ventricular tumor, uh, it's hard to pick out the caudate and the thalamus. But you see the thalamostrite vein, the choroid plexus, if the thalamostrite vein is to the right, of the choroid plexus, you've opened into the right lateral ventricle. If it's to the left of the choroid plexus, you've opened into the left lateral ventricle. Uh, and in coming from the body to the third ventricle, you come through the velum interpositum so that you come through or around four layers of tissue and the upper layer is the fornix. And here we folded a fornix backwards, and we see the velum interpositum that it has an upper layer of tela and a pendimal membrane below the fornix. So we have fornix and then tela, and then we open the tela, we're into the velum interpositum that contains the internal cerebral veins, and what group of arteries, what arteries do you see here? Medial posterior choroidal arteries, and then we open that lower layer of tela, and you're looking into third ventricle. Um, and for the transcolossal approach, we said we turn the flap one-third behind, two-thirds in front of the coronal suture to take advantage of this area where there's a relative paucity of veins going to the sagittal sinus. The veins at the front of the sinus tend to be directed backwards. As you go progressively posterior, the veins entering the sinus take on a progressively forward curve before entering the sinus and it leaves this area here that where there's a relative paucity of bridging veins. A number of textbooks say go one-third in front, two-thirds in back for the bone flap, 
But here you see that there's, uh, you often get into this area where there's venous lacunae, large bridging veins. So one third back, two thirds forward is better. And then to locate the foramen of Monroe, we measure back one inch, 2.5 centimeters, and make our colossal incision, and we uh, come in then above the foramen of Monroe, and which ventricle are we in? We're in the right lateral ventricle. Foramen, the thalamostride vein is to the right of the choroid plexus, so we're in the right lateral ventricle. To open the choroidal fissure, we get on the edge of the fornix and separate off the choroid plexus, and we look in at the velum interpositum. Just opening back one centimeter gives you a view all the way back to the aqueduct. We don't like to get over between the plexus and the thalamus because that makes it easy to damage the thalamostride vein. And in general, it's easier to work between the internal cerebral veins than to work between the vein and the thalamus. If you get in this plane, then it's easy to lose some of the venous drainage out of the thalamus and internal capsule. So fornix, thalamus, transcoroidal approach through the tinea fornix. Here's the lower layer of tela, and we have a large massa intermedia in this area, but opening usually just a centimeter of the fissure gives you a view back to the aqueduct. And here we're looking into third ventricle, and here would be foramen of Monroe that we've enlarged, uh, column of fornix. What is here in anterior wall of third? Anterior commissure, and then below it, lamina terminalis, and this recess, chiasmatic, back edge of chiasm. What recess? Infidibular, mammillary bodies. And we do third ventriculostomy. We go behind the mammillary bodies in this area. Yes? No. No. We go in front. What is located in this area? Well, if you look at this area below the floor of the third, in this area, here are mammillary bodies. So if you go back here, you get into basilar apex, inner peduncular fossa, thalamoperforating arteries, midbrain, third nerve nuclei. So you always want to go forward here between mammillary bodies and infundibular recess through this area for third ventriculostomy. What is this? Third nerve, third nerve. This is P1, P2, Pearl, ambient cistern. Uh, now, the one situation where it's easy to get in to the, through the fornix and the midline to do an interfornoceal approach is when there's a large cavum that separates the halves of the body of the fornix so that you have a cavity that goes right down to the roof of the third between these separated halves of the body of the fornix, and that makes it easy to do an interfornoceal approach that comes through then through the body of the fornix here behind the foramen of Monroe. So that's
one situation where we would, might use an intraforniceal approach instead of coming through the choroidal fissure. Now, we're going to work our way around the fissure. Uh, and here we're for Amon of Monroe. And we're going to open the fissure. Are we going to open the fissure behind the foramen at A or B? At B on the fornicial side. So we work our way back along the fissure, fornix, thalamus. We come back to the quadrigeminal cistern. What arteries? Medial posterior choroidal, vein of Galen. We're looking, we've opened it, we let the choroid plexus always go with the thalamus and internal capsule. And as you work directly medial then and come around the fissure, we see the, what vein? Basal vein internal cerebral vein, vein of Galen, and right in this area, directly medial to the fissure, you see the pineal. So this is an approach through the choroidal fissure to the quadrigeminal cistern. The only time that we're coming through this route from the atrium is if we're dealing with lesions in the glomus like AVMs or uh, meningiomas in the atrium or choroid plexus tumors that are fed by choroidal arteries and drained by choroidal veins. So this would be a transchoroidal approach from the atrium to the quadrigeminal cistern. Usually for atrium, we're either coming through the medial surface of the hemisphere and here we see what sulcus, calcarine, and prieto-occipital. This is what gyrus, lingual, and between calcarine and parieto-occipital sulcus, we call that cuneus. That's lower visual field. And then this area in front of the parieto-occipital area is precuneus. So that Yasser Gill has given us this precuneus approach. Fox, calcarine, parieto-occipital sulcus. And this is precuneus area in front of the projections of the visual field. And you can come through precuneus to atrium. Also, this parieto-occipital sulcus cuts deeply into the medial surface of the hemisphere, and you can open it and come. This is cuneus side, precuneus side. You can open through this anterior wall the precuneus side into the atrium, glomus of plexus, uh, but you don't want to open the cuneus side of the parieto-occipital sulcus. Or you can come through the lateral margin of the corpus callosum here, uh, just in this area to the atrium. That would be considered a transcallosal approach but probably the most common approach is to come through the superior parietal lobule or the intraparietal sulcus. And that intraparietal sulcus cuts deeply into the hemisphere, and you can open through it into the atrium, although I think it's more common to come through the superior parietal lobule. But for Approaches to the pineal region, uh, we either come above or below the tentorium. Uh, in general, I would say surgeons operating on adults 
prefer to come above the tent. Pediatric neurosurgeons tend to use the infratentorial approaches more commonly. And here we're looking at pineal region, superior, inferior colliculi, fourth nerve. And if you come over the apex of the vermis, it's difficult to get down below the inferior colliculus along the collicular plate down to the fourth nerve. But if you come paramedian off the midline, it's easier to get low in this precentral cerebellar fissure, or we call it cerebellar midbrain fissure. So here's the median approach over the apex of the vermis, superior vermian vein. Here is basal vein, internal cerebral. What arteries? Superior cerebellar, posterior cerebral. And coming over the apex of the vermis, you can see the pineal. What artery? Medial, posterior choroidal. You can see the superior, but usually not the inferior colliculus. You can open the velum interpositum. I've worked forward from here all the way to the foramen of Monroe using this suprapineal velum interpositum approach. But if you want to come low on the midbrain, below the inferior colliculus to the area of the fourth nerve, then you can come off of the apex of the vermis and do a paramedian approach that gives you quadrigeminal cistern, collicular plate, fourth nerve, and here is the cerebral peduncle. So this is going to be what cistern in here? It gives you back end of crural and ambient cistern leading back to the quadrigeminal cistern using this infratentorial approach. The other route to this area is occipital transtentorial. And if you look at the area of the sagittal sinus below the lambdoid suture, there are no bridging veins to the sinus. The veins posteriorly are directed forward and usually there are no bridging veins to the posterior six centimeters of the sagittal sinus so that we can re retract the occipital lobe. Here we're on the tent, pineal, and then we can divide the tent adjacent the straight sinus and gain this exposure of quadrigeminal cistern, pineal, superior colliculus. You also have ambient and a little bit of crural cistern in this area. And it also gives you access above the vein of Galen to the corpus callosum using this occipital transtentorial approach. And here we've divided the tent occipital lobe, Fox, an approach that I've used for meningiomas of the tentorial apex is after dividing the tent to divide the posterior Fox that gives you access to the tentorial apex and then you can divide the contralateral half of the tent preserving the venous connection here into the straight sinus, and you can deal with tumors here in the area of the tentorial apex. And if you're on the side of a non-dominant transverse sinus, you can divide that transverse sinus and do a combined supra-infratentorial exposure then of, of the 
uh, area above and below the tent. Now we move on around to the temporal lobe, and notice how the temporal lobe slopes upward as you go from lateral to medial. We see the uncus there, lateral to the cerebral peduncle, and we see interpeduncular, curl, ambient, quadrigeminal cistern on the medial side of the temporal lobe. So that as you look at temporal lobe, one of the most complicated areas that we deal with is medial aspect of temporal lobe. We have uncus and then ambient cistern, quadrigeminal cistern related to temporal lobe, and it extends back to the junction of the parieto occipital and calcarine sulci so that you can divide medial temporal lobe into an anterior part of medial temporal lobe, a middle part uh, from back edge of uncus to quadrigeminal cistern, and then from quadrigeminal cistern back to the junction of the parieto occipital and calcarine sulci. So anterior, middle, posterior part of medial temporal lobe. And, and for anyone who could name all these gyri on the anterior part of the medial temporal lobe, I'll buy a cup of coffee at coffee break. The rest of you don't get any coffee, but uh, so anterior part of medial temporal lobe extends from what is the sulcus along the lateral side of the uncus? What do we call that? Parahippocampal gyrus extends forward and then laterally this extends lateral here uh, to parahippocampal gyrus, rhinal sulcus. Now on this upper surface of the anterior third of medial temporal lobe, we have what gyrus in this area? Anyone? Semi-lunar. And uh, what is this sulcus? Semi-annular. And then we have ambient, uncinate gyrus, and this upper part of medial temporal lobe is really related to enfolded head of hippocampus. The lower part here below this uncle notch is the anterior part of parahippocampal gyrus. Uh, so this is, and there's three sort of gyri in this area, intralimbic, band of Giacomini, uh, uncinate gyri in this area. These are really just continuation of this gyrus above the parahippocampal gyrus, this beaded gyrus that is known as the dentate gyrus. So this part of the anterior uh, part of medial temporal lobe is mainly enfolded head of hippocampus. And here this is the sylvian vallecula. The middle cerebral artery runs laterally through this area. So here we see anterior choroidal artery uh, arise here medial to uh, semilunar gyrus run along this semi-annular sulcus and enter the temporal horn at the inferior choroidal point, and then running along this posterior segment of the uncus, we have the P2 segment of posterior cerebral artery. Another view of this area of uncus from medially, we see 10 edge, and in herniations, this uncus can 
herniate through the tentorial edge here. We see posterior cerebral running medial to this uncle notch, and we see the anterior choroidal artery running along the semiannular sulcus and entering the temporal horn at the inferior choroidal point, and then passing through this area uh, uh, here, we see the middle cerebral actually arise from the carotid, pass along the anterior segment of the uncus that contains the amygdala, and then runs laterally toward the sylvian fissure. Now, middle part of, uh, of medial temporal lobe is here in the lateral margin of the ambient cistern, and this area has roughly three layers here, a lower layer uh, here that is medial to the collateral sulcus, and then above that is the dentate gyrus, and above that is the fimbria. So three layers in this lateral wall of uh, ambient cistern. Here we see the optic tract, and what is this? Lateral geniculate body here in the roof of the ambient cistern. This is inferior choroidal point, and then choroidal fissure here between the thalamus, lateral geniculate, and the fimbria of the fornix. And temporal horn, if we look at it, uh, in the floor medially is hippocampus. Laterally is a second prominence in the floor that overlies the deep end of the collateral sulcus that we call the collateral eminence. And then the roof is formed by tapetal fibers from the callosum. These tapetal fibers separate the roof from the optic radiations Medially, you have the tail of the caudate, and then lateral geniculate body, and the choroidal fissure between the fornix and between the fornix and the thalamus. And always, when we're opening the choroidal fissure, we want to open on the fornicial side so that we preserve this sublenticular part of the internal capsule that contains the optic radiations. Uh, so if we look at medial temporal lobe from below, we see anterior segment of uncus that contains amygdala, posterior segment of uncus facing the peduncle across the crural cistern, it contains the enfolded head of the hippocampus, and then we come backwards and we have parahippocampal gyrus, collateral sulcus, and here now we've removed the medial part of parahippocampal gyrus, and you see why this, how this developed this hippocampal name or seahorse of we take off the lower, this part of parahippocampal gyrus, and we see dentate gyrus, fimbria, and this seahorse appearance, and we see intralimbic band of Giacomini um, uncinate gyri on that posterior segment of the uncus, and then here, uh, we've removed the dentate gyrus. Looking from below, we see the amygdala and the anterior wall of the temporal horn. Uh, we preserve the fimbria here, and the choroidal fissure is attached on one side to the tenia fimbria, on the other side to the tenia thalami, and the thalamus in this area, 
is made up of pulvinar. Here we have lateral and medial geniculate body in the roof of the ambient cistern. And then if we take off the fimbria, we're looking at the roof of the temporal horn. We see the, the optic nerve, chiasm, track come back to the lateral geniculate body. This is the area of the amygdala. And then if we go one step deeper, why here we see optic tract come back to lateral geniculate body, and then Myers loop loop forward in the roof of the temporal horn, and then the optic radiations come back around the lateral wall of the temporal horn to end up back here along the calcarine sulcus. Uh, so that you can visualize this as you move layer by layer with the optic radiations in the sublenticular part of the internal capsule. And these fibers are running on the side of the th thalamic side of the choroidal fissure in the temporal horn, so we always want to open the fimbria side. Now, here with DTI, we see chiasm, nerve, optic tract. Uh, what is this? Lateral geniculate, Myers loop. Where is the lesion? It's, here's lateral geniculate, lateral geniculate, but this type of imaging is going to play an increasingly important role, but just a view of optic tract, lateral geniculate, Myers loop, looping forward usually to the anterior edge of the roof of the temporal horn, so that uh, and just some of the imaging of optic radiations today. Uh, now the uncus, we said, had an anterior segment, a posterior segment, and an apex. And here we see anterior segment containing amygdala, posterior segment containing head of hippocampus, and then an apex that's lateral to the third nerve. And then laterally, we have an uncle recess. If you look into the temporal horn from lateral optic radiations above, here's the uncle recess between the amygdala and the head of the hippocampus. And you've already seen the uncle notch as we looked at the medial surface. Now, parahippocampal gyrus has a and three surfaces. It has a lower surface that faces the middle fossa and tent, a rounded medial surface, and then an upper surface that is medial to the dentate gyrus. And often the posterior cerebral artery runs not below, not medial, but on the upper surface of parahippocampal gyrus in this area. Here we see it looping up toward that upper surface of parahippocampal gyrus, medial to dentate gyrus. And here's just another view. We're looking across temporal lobe at third nerve. This is the upper surface of parahippocampal gyrus. So, and we see the posterior cerebral artery so that if we were trying to reach pathology here and you were coming in below the temporal lobe, you would only reach that pathology when you've done great damage to the lower part of the temporal lobe. So in some cases, it's easier to come through the 
temporal horn through the choroidal fissure to reach pathology in the upper part of the ambient cistern. And there are a number of these aneurysms on high basilar bifurcations that are tilted off to one side that set medial to the temporal horn and have been accessed by the transchoroidal approach through the temporal horn. So one way of getting to ambient cistern is to come subtemporal. And, uh, but if you come subtemporal, you can reach the lower part of the medial surface of the parahippocampal gyrus, but you can't reach this upper part, upper reaches of the ambient cistern. Another way, and there are a number of papers that have been uh, published using the posterior approach to the area of the ambient cistern. It, it avoids damaging these large bridging veins coming off the lower surface of the hemisphere. You come posteriorly to the area of the ambient cistern. But coming posteriorly, you can get a little higher, but you cannot reach the upper part of the ambient cistern. But coming through the choroidal fissure, you can reach this upper surface of parahippocampal gyrus. And here we've opened the choroidal fissure, and here is hippocampus. What is this? Here is thalamus, and this is lateral geniculate body. We always, when we open the fissure, let the choroid plexus go with the thalamic side. We've opened through the fissure. We see posterior cerebral, 10 edge, a little bit of fourth nerve. If you retract the amygdala here, you can reach forward to basilar, basilar apex, T1, P2, third nerve. If you divide on through the amygdala, then for complicated pathology in this area, you have carotid, what artery? Communicating choroidal, P1, P2, and here we see medial posterior choroidal arising from P1, passing through cruel ambient and quadrigeminal cistern. So subtemporal approach really doesn't get you very high. You can get the lower surface Coming posteriorly, you reach a little higher in the ambient cistern, but for pathology in the upper reaches of the ambient cistern, you often have to come through the temporal horn. And here's just a, a view of, here's the approach. If you leave the temporalis muscle folded over the zygomatic arch, if you divide the arch and fold the muscle down out of the way, you see what a much lower trajectory you have below the temporal lobe to the area of the inner peduncular and ambient cistern. So now venous drainage of this medial temporal lobe is usually directed posteriorly from Pearl to ambient to quadrigeminal cistern to vein of Galen. Uh, and the large veins draining the roof of the temporal horn here that drain the optic radiations pass through the thalamic side, the lateral geniculate side of the choroidal fissure here, so that. We always want to save these optic radiations in the roof of the temporal horn and save their venous drainage 
And we do that by opening the fimbria, the fornicele side of the choroidal fissure if we're going to the ambient or quadrigeminal cistern, just a view into the third ventricle from below, anterior commissure, lamina terminalis. What part of fornix is this? Columns of fornix, anterior to foramen of Monroe. And here we see the lower side of velum interpositum. So temporal horn, temporal lobe, drainage is usually backwards from the deep part of the Selvian fissure, the interhemispheric surface back through crural, ambient, quadrigeminal cistern. But if you're dealing with vascular lesions, why you can have this anterior segment of uncus draining into cavernous sinus or a long sylvian fissure. This segment may be hypoplastic. Or you can see a hypoplastic posterior segment. And most of this drainage uh, drains down the lateral mesencephalic vein. Or you can have several segments uh, absent. And in planning operative procedures to this area, especially vascular tumors and AVMs, it's important to preoperatively on angiography dissect out these patterns of venous drainage of medial temporal lobe. And to finish off, we'll just talk about a few approaches that are used to medial temporal lobe. One is to go through the lower surface here of the temporal lobe along one of the sulci to the temporal horn and to complete an amygdalal hippocampectomy. Another is to do an anterior temporal lobectomy and then expose the temporal horn and do the medial temporal lobe resection. A third route that has been used is to come transylvian down through the inferior limiting sulcus to the temporal horn, a Yasergel type approach for amygdalohippocampectomy. And the last one, you can come through the cisterns and do a transcisternal approach of to medial temporal lobe. So uh, here's just the typical uh, uh, exposure of temporal lobe. And one of the routes you can get in below the temporal lobe here in, say, collateral sulcus or lateral to fusiform gyrus here in this area and open one of the sulci. And here we see anterior, posterior segment of uncus, third nerve here medial to apex of uncus, communicating anterior choroidal artery. Uh, and here we elevate temporal lobe. We can open into a sulcus to access temporal horn. Uh, here we see hippocampus, choroid plexus. If you're going to open the choroidal fissure in the temporal horn, are you going to open at A or B? At B, along the fimbria, along the hippocampal side, because the largest veins draining through the fissure drain the optic radiation and the uh, sublenticular part of the internal capsule that is in the roof of the temporal horn. So here we've opened into temporal horn, the roof. Here we see the choroid plexus. There's relatively few veins that you see on the hippocampus, but the big veins draining the optic radiations in the roof pass through the thalamic side of the choroidal fissure. So are we going to open the fissure at A or B?
will open along the hippocampal side. Here we let the choroid plexus go with the roof. Here's lateral geniculate. The optic radiation Myers loop are coming forward. We leave that venous drainage intact. We go along the edge of the fimbria to access the lateral geniculate, the ambient cistern, and then we can open through the amygdala here to complete a temporal lobectomy. How far back can you resect the hippocampus? Well, at the back edge of the hippocampus, it blends into the calcar avus uh, in the medial part of the, the atrium. And at the calcar avus, you have optic radiation. So we can resect hippocampus back to the anterior edge of the calcar avus. We see again the area of the optic radiations, lateral geniculate, all preserved using this transcarotal approach through the tinea fornix or through the fimbria part of the fornix. Now, another way of going to temporal horn is coming transylvian, temporal lobe, frontal lobe, insula here, M1, M2. And in this approach, we see lemon insula and then the inferior limiting sulcus along lower margin of insula. And in the approach, as it was initially described, the incision is here behind the lemon in the inferior limiting sulcus. And you come through this area at a depth of about eight millimeters. You enter the temporal horn. We see the hippocampus, choroid plexus, and we've opened the choroidal fissure. We let the choroid plexus go with the roof. We've opened along the tinea fimbria to expose the ambient cistern. And just a view into the ambient cistern, fornix, and here the choroid plexus goes with the roof, with the optic radiations, basal vein, posterior cerebral artery, and then from here you can complete the amygdalohippocampectomy. Uh, just another view of that area. And, but as we started doing fiber dissections, we found that if you get in below the insula, here behind the lemon, and make an incision along the inferior limiting sulcus, you come along Myers Loop in this area. And here is inferior limiting sulcus, insula, and if you divide through here, you see lateral geniculate, Myers loop coming forward. And by coming through the inferior limiting sulcus, you come, may come across Myers loop. Now, if you look at this area, what is this setting above the amygdala in the anterior segment of the uncus? Setting here above amygdala. This is optic tract coming back to lateral geniculate, giving rise to Myers loop. And so rather than coming through laterally here, you can come through the anterior segment of the uncus uh, here through the amygdala to the temporal horn, sparing Myers loop, and coming under the optic tract in this area so that there is a safe area coming from above between Myers loop and the optic tract, this V-shaped safe area so that here we have temporal lobe, uh, 
Ancilla, frontal lobe, lemon in this area, inferior limiting sulcus. So rather than coming through the inferior limiting sulcus, we can shift the approach around to the anterior segment of the uncus where the amygdala sets just below the cortical surface. You can open into the temporal horn and complete then an amygdalo hippocampectomy. Here we see the uh, ten edge, the optic radiations, a fiber dissection, they've been preserved. The most common approach to this area is using a temporal lobectomy. You open into the temporal horn. Here we've opened through the amygdala. We see the anterior choroidal artery passing back to the inferior choroidal point, the hippocampus, and here's medial surface of temporal lobe. Here, fimbria, dentate gyrus, parahippocampal gyrus. Here is posterior segment of uncus with the enfolded head of hippocampus. Always when you're doing a resection of medial temporal lobe, you have to uh, sacrifice these hippocampal arteries going in between the parahippocampal and dentate gyrus while preserving these arteries that go to the lateral surface of the temporal lobe so that as you open backwards you see these hippocampal arteries. We sacrifice those. This is the amygdala, hippocampus, and the anterior temporal resection. Another way of coming to this area is through the cisterns lateral to the optic nerve adjacent carotid M1. You expose third nerve, posterior communicating, and you can resect amygdala, anterior part of hippocampus using this transcisternal approach uh, to the anterior part of the medial temporal lobe. Here, third nerve. We see posterior cerebral artery. And here, crural cistern, cerebral peduncle. So these are some of the routes that we can take to medial temporal lobe. I think at this stage, coffee break is here. Uh, and I don't think I owe anyone a cup of coffee, so I'll let all of you have a cup of coffee then. <laughs>